I'll go to Ms. Stefanik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony today. I wanted to build on Mr. Courtney's uh, previous line of questioning. I represent Fort Drum, home of the 10th Mountain Division, and brigades from the 10th Mountain are currently forward deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq. And on a recent CODEL with Chairman Whitman to Top Gun, I was able to see the significance and the critical role that the Navy has in providing close air support for troops on the ground, specifically for the 10th Mountain Division. Can you explain to me how the implementation of OFRP restricts, impedes, or helps the Navy's ability in a joint environment, and in particular in the Middle East AO? I would say that OFRP actually optimizes our readiness to support not only naval functions and missions, but optimizes our ability to participate as a joint partner. So for over a decade, we've fought wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, providing things like close air support. We're currently engaged in operations now against ISIL, providing air support uh, to uh, enable our objectives in that fight as well. When you look at jointness, we are a joint force. We certainly have maritime mission tasks that we execute critical mission task to support uh, maritime security of our globe, the underpinning of the global economy, but we operate frequently in joint exercises and joint forces. It's part of our DNA now to be able to do that. So we can uh, optimize the readiness that it delivers the global presence that enables the joint force execution of missions like those in Afghanistan. And the fleet response plan is simply that. It's a readiness generator. The optimized fleet response plan simply optimizes the existing plan that we have. But we're also using the optimized fleet response plan to reset in stride, to get back to our ability to provide the global force presence that we need, as well as a surge capacity. It's going to take several years to get there, but it's absolutely critical for our ability to maintain global requirements in terms of presence, but also the ability to respond to crises. My second question, oh, I'm sure, sorry, go ahead, Captain. Just add, uh, I'd just like to thank you for, for saying that. And I, I think a lot of people don't really realize how busy the Navy has been supporting our troops on the ground in, uh, in the Middle East especially. I had the privilege of spending five months, as C five months out, out there while I was CEO of USS Ronald Reagan. And we took great pride in the fact that we never missed a sortie that was going over, over land to go support our troops on the ground. And we, we always had the section that whatever it was, the package that was flying to go check in was ready to support those troops on the ground. So uh, I, I think a lot of folks don't really understand that. This is, it's, well, that's the Navy. They're not, they're not busy doing this, this ground fight. And, and so it, we sort of let it sneak up on us, our collective understanding of how much we were stressing our force to be able to provide that that air cover, that air presence, and all the ships associated with, with providing from the sea support. Uh, so I, I really appreciate you, you mentioning that. Thank you. Well, we certainly are grateful, and I know the soldiers from the 10th Mountain Division that I represent are grateful for that support. Um, my second question, which deals with a different topic, has to do with retention. As you know, retaining the best and the brightest soldiers is a huge issue, and it's at the top of the priority list for the Army right now. And you touched on this a bit, Admiral, in your opening statement. Can you please elaborate on why and how the OFRP helps retain sailors and any impact on their quality of life and more stability for their families? Absolutely. So one of the dilemmas that our people face under the demands of global presence in the past has been uh, a lack of predictability. Um, deployments get extended. People get surged early. Because we haven't been able to align our manpower systems, you'd be pulled off of one ship and put onto another. The ships suffer in readiness in terms of what we call fit and fill, having the right person with the right skills. And this translates into uh, not, being, not having the resources that you need to do your job. And so it leads to a frustration that probably culminates in reduced retention. We've settled in the OFRP on a seven-month deployment. It's the optimal de deployment length that meets the ability to 
enable the transit distances of the globe to get where we need to be, to be where it matters, when it matters. Uh, and yet at the same time, we don't want those deployments to be too long. Uh, there are physical things that start to happen around the eight month point on ships. Uh, and we've done the rigorous analysis to show that extended deployments have impacts on retention. So what the optimized fleet response plan will do is not only giving you better tools and fit and fill, it should give our sailors and their family a predictability that we haven't had in the past. Thank you very much. I yield back.